started again. Uh, and actually, I don't know if our opening uh, um, slide, ah, perfect. All right, so welcome back. This is uh, session two of our uh, workshop. And uh, during this session, we're gonna be looking at uh, case studies of current approaches for determining causality. I'm Kevin Elliott from Michigan State University. I'll be moderating and I'm a member of the uh, Committee on Emerging Science for Environmental Health Decisions. So in terms of our format, we'll have four speakers. Each of them will be speaking for 20 minutes and then we'll have time for a panel discussion at the end. So uh, first, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Martin Smith, who will be speaking on the key characteristics of carcinogens. We're finding him, he'll be right here. So we're gonna move on to our second speaker while we find Martin. So our second speaker is Mary Beth Terry speaking on inferring causality. Okay, so, uh, so we're gonna go back to the first speaker. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> so we're just trying to keep everybody on their toes here. Um, so, all right, so back to our first speaker, uh, Martin Smith, on the key characteristics of carcinogens. Just in time, great. Thank you. So I was talking as usual and lost track of time. Um, so I'm going to um, um, talk to you about uh, this idea of key characteristics of carcinogens and how it fits into basically uh, understanding the causes of cancer and determining whether something is a carcinogen or not. So how do we decide if a chemical is a carcinogen? Um, well, traditionally, we've used this approach of using human studies or epidemiology, um, and animal, uh, combi combined with animal studies such as rodent bioassays, uh, lifetime chronic ones or shorter transgenic ones. Now, the problem with, partly with this, is that the number of epidemiology studies uh, of, say, occupational settings and things like this is declining. And the number of rodent bioassays that are being performed by government programs or other entities is also declining. So we're getting less and less information which we rely on. And then on the other hand, the number of chemicals that are in commercial use and being produced is increasing. Uh, and total number of chemical use in the world is increasing. Um, it's um, a $3.9 trillion business selling chemicals in the world of uh, which China actually now constitutes $1.4 trillion. So there's a lot of chemicals out there and a lot of testing that needs to be done, and the top two really aren't going to cut it. So we're also moving to in vitro studies, such as TOX21 and TOXCast, are generally replacing animals. And this is generating very large amounts of data on large amount numbers of chemicals, but interpreting it is difficult. And the very important component now of understanding whether human data such as biomarkers is important or whether animal data is relevant is the relevance of mechanistic data and how to actually look at this idea of um, biological plausibility and 
whether or not mechanistic data alone could be sufficient to determine whether something was a carcinogen or not. So there's so many studies and so little time is typically the problem with mechanistic data. Um, cancer in humans, the, you know, we have typically tens to hundreds of studies on a particular chemical, tens of studies on cancer in animals, but we can have thousands of studies with mechanistic information about a particular chemical. So when we started this process of looking at key characteristics, we were really faced with this idea of how do you search systematically for relevant mechanisms and how to bring uniformity across these assessments of mechanistic type data. And there's also a tremendous database to be uh, analyzed efficiently. So as part of the process which was started by Vince Colliano, he was here in the room I think, uh, under Monographs 100, uh, he had the idea along with others at IARC that um, they could take the information about what was known about carcinogens to really determine do, what do we know about how human carcinogens cause cancer mechanistically and secondly what do we know about concordance between animal studies and humans and I won't go into the second part but basically the idea was to get a working group to look at all of this information and try to make some sense of it. So um, IARC in 2012 convened a group of people that I was on um, to look at this idea of what, what have we learned about mechanisms from the hundred odd or so agents which we know uh, are human carcinogens from the IARC database. And one of the ideas was that, well, why don't we try looking at them in relation to the hallmarks of cancer, which are shown here and have been mentioned earlier. Uh, Hannah Hannah Weinberg first proposed them in 2012, sorry, 2000, and then revised them in 2011. And unknown to us at the same time, another project was going on called the Halifax Project, which was not using IARC carcinogens, but was putting forward the idea of how do these hallmarks fit into the progression of cancer and the influence of chemicals on cancer. And they came up with this interesting idea uh, by Goodson et al. that you could, you, could, um, you could imagine cancer occurring as a result of these hallmarks where genomic instability was one of the earliest changes and angiogenesis one of the later ones and you could imagine chemicals influencing um, these different hallmarks at different stages of the process so in a temporal manner and producing cancer and this would mean that a chemical that altered the tumor microenvironment may assist in a chemical in being a carcinogen, may be a substantial contributor to this disease, but may not actually be a complete carcinogen itself. And so this uh, is interesting. It's interesting from the viewpoint of mixtures of low-dose chemicals producing cancer, uh, but it actually doesn't really tell us about the properties of chemical carcinogens. I'm going to skip over this because of shortness of time. Um, the dilemma we have really is that the hallmarks are really not the properties of carcinogenic chemicals, but are the character not characteristic properties, they're characteristics of the uh, of the tumor itself, of the cancer itself. So while we would expect chemicals to alter these processes that are involved in the hallmarks, they're not actually hallmarks of carcinogens, if you see what I mean. So we set about thinking about, well, if they're the hallmarks of cancer, what are the hallmarks of carcinogens? And we're calling them characteristics just really to separate them from, um, from the hallmarks. So the other thing that became apparent to us when we were doing this was that clearly chemicals that produce cancer did so by doing many things. It was very rare to find something that was a carcinogen that just did one thing. So almost all the carcinogens that we could list in group one that we initially looked at back in 2009 with Kate Guyton and others was things like arsenic and aflatoxin and asbestos. They were all basically caused gene mutations or the genotoxic in some way. And they had many other effects affecting the immune system, causing epigenetic effects, causing inflammation. And so there was a possibility that 
basically group one carcinogens would actually have multiple uh, characteristics. So we set about this idea of identifying what were the key characteristics of carcinogens. And I have to say, initially we came up with a list of around 26, and this just seemed too complicated and too lengthy, and many were overlapping. So we had one statistician in the room, and we asked him how many he would like, and he said 10. <laughs> um, and so uh, we ended up with 10. So, uh, so we, we managed to force these things that were in different groups into, into the 10 key characteristics. We may need the 11th now, I don't know. But um, these are the ones. And these are the ones basically the working group agreed upon. And subsequent to the working group meeting, we uh, various scientists at EPA, IARC, and elsewhere really helped fine-tune this and find the evidence for these key characteristics and list what they were about. So the first key characteristics are things like electrophilicity and genotoxicity, and it goes on, uh, which I'll go over in just a minute. So evidence that these characteristics are observed in humans or as immediate intermediate biomarkers in human specimens helps provide biological plausibility, especially in the context of an IARC evaluation, where they look at basically is there, what's the evidence in humans, what's the evidence in experimental animals, and they rank the, the mechanistic evidence according to whether there is a mechanism that's strong, uh, moderate, or weak, and operates in humans. And so this idea that the characteristics could be observed in humans or human specimens becomes very important in an IARC type evaluation. So these are the, the, the key characteristics. Electrophilicity, basically, does it get activated or is the chemical an electrophile? which will form DNA and protein adducts? Does it cause DNA damage? Is it genotoxic um, through various things like cytogenetic changes, micronuclei? Does it alter DNA repair, things like topoisomerase 2, um, or alter double-strand break repair? Um, does it cause epigenetic alterations? And by epigenetics here, we mean the ones like DNA methylation, histone modification, and microRNA expression. We don't mean non-genotoxic effects. Um, oxidative stress, does it induce oxygen radicals, things like this, and oxidative damage to molecules. Um, chronic inflammation, elevated white blood cells, altered cytokines, things like this. Is it immunosuppressive, where it would decrease immunosurveillance and uh, immune system dysfunction? Then really a category that probably did need expanding and should have been more than one, receptor-mediated effects, because there is a possibility here for chemicals to act on a particular receptor, either as an agonist or an antagonist, or to actually modulate the endogenous ligands, basically hormones, that are present in the body. So an aromatase inhibitor, for example, would fit into this section because it would alter the level of estrogen and testosterone or other hormones in the body, uh, and not necessarily being... Um, acting on a particular receptor, but the hormones would act on the receptor. So this is really a very large category, if you think about it, with PPR gamma and uh, estrogen receptor, et cetera, and hormones being altered. Causes immortalization, which is a, a common thing for viruses to do, but also includes things like altering telomeres and uh, inhibiting senescence. And finally, another pretty large catch-all category, which is in alters cell proliferation, cell death, and nutrient supply, and angiogenesis and increased proliferation fits into this, or decreasing apoptosis fits into this category. So once you've outlined these, 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 uh, this list, this then allowed us to do targeted searches for each of the key characteristics. So you could pick the key characteristics, put in a set of search terms into this, and organize the results, which were done using this Hawk project uh, software, but there is other software that could be used to basically take the, the key characteristics, take uh, the, the literature search, and break it down into subcomponents. And you can't see this, this part very well here, but basically this breaks it down into whether it's human, or, uh, or experimental animal, and then these are the key characteristics here as to what's, what's been found. And basically the number of papers that are there. 
And this allows you to go from a very large number of papers to a manageable number for a small subgroup to review. So um, we did this for several compounds. We did this for benzene, for example, and PCBs. And this shows the example of benzene. I can't see the numbers here, but I'm just remembering them off the top of my head. It's something like 1,800 here. And we end up, for each of the key characteristics, of having you know, 50 or 8 or some much smaller number, which can then be looked at by a group of one or two or three people. And they can then decide, what's the evidence for it being strong, moderate, or weak? And this is a way to take your subgroup or your mechanism or group of experts and allow them to reach consensus very quickly about a very large uh, body of data. So we did this um, for benzene, as I mentioned. And um, I want to bring up now this idea of the characteristics idea versus the adverse outcome pathway idea. So adverse outcome pathways have become an idea we've heard Paolo and Jonathan talk this morning about pathways. And pathways, it always confuses me. I'm a biochemist, so I think of the Krebs cycle as a pathway. Um, I don't see things where it goes from a mutation to a something and a change in a tissue as being a pathway. Um, biology, that's biology and physiology, and I don't, I really don't see that as pathways. And pathways confuse me when I look at them in the toxicological literature. So, and this is a pathway here that is basically been described elsewhere in the literature as a, a mod mode of action for benzene. Basically, the idea is the benzene's activated to some sort of electrophilic metabolite. You get DNA damage and mutations. This happens in a stem cell. These stem cells that rapidly, uh, these stem cells are mutated, they grow, and you get leukemia. Yeah, right. Um, unfortunately, it's bit more complicated than that, I think, uh, involving many other things of the hallmarks of cancer, including, including um, the microenvironment and other effects. So benzene also affects AHR and modulates this receptor. This receptor controls the number of stem cells which are cycling at any one time, which clearly will make a difference in terms of uh, how uh, leukemogenic something is. Benzene also causes epigenetic alterations, which again will alter this stem cell um, transformation rate. Finally, you have oxidative damage, which is a clear pattern from benzene, which can produce additional DNA damage. Topoisomerase inhibition and inhibition of DNA repair is also present, which, which emphasizes which cells have the most chromosome aberrations and mutations. <coughs> and finally, Benzene is a well-known suppressor of the immune system, so you reduce immune surveillance, allowing this to happen. So this, uh, this then is basically eight key characteristics put together in some sort of adverse outcome network rather than a pathway. So it's actually an adverse outcome network, each of which has uh, di probably different dose responses and different um, effects in different people. And you have a systems type of approach with this. And so we have to think in things in terms of systems biology and networks rather than pathways. And um, we have to be very careful of simplistic hypotheses of how things work. Because hypotheses are good in science. And it sounds like it's good to have hypotheses in science, which it is. right? That's how we do it. But hypothesis-based regulation or decision making is somewhat difficult because you, what if your hypothesis is wrong? Then the regulations are all wrong, and it's not easy to go back. And new information will all be gen always be generated in science, and the hypothesis and theory will keep evolving. This is how science is done. But it's not good for immediate decision making. So talking of decision making, this, these characteristics have now been used in a series of... Um, Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. <laughs> um, how many minutes do I have? One or so? two? Oh, it's back. Two. OK. So these have started to be used in a variety of um, uh, recent monographs. And Kate Guyton put this graph to get together for me. Um, and you can see, basically, that the mechanistic evidence where 
for, have been very important in putting things in 2A, for example, where these, uh, these um, compounds have um, produced these different key characteristics. And you generally can see that the more key characteristics you have, the more probable that the chemical is a carcinogen. Uh, I'm going to skip this for the basis of time. That basically is just a new meta-analysis on 2,4-D, linking it to lymphoma, which supports it. So now we have to think about, okay, so we have these key characteristics of carcinogens. They seem to be working in terms of analyzing the mechanistic evidence in things like IARC evaluation. What's next for, for these? Because we developed these a little while ago. So what we're working on now is the re refinement of the definitions and listing for all of these key characteristics. And really, the, what's really needed is the development of high-throughput assays, which are specific for each of these key characteristics. It's very difficult to fit the current ToxCast and Tox21 data into these key characteristics. And certainly, several pharmaceutical companies have approached me about the idea of developing such assays for the, for the testing of new drugs and pharmaceuticals. And I think this is a, a very good way to go. And as suggested in the recent report that um, John referred to earlier from the National Academy, the key characteristics there was also suggested that we develop key characteristics for other endpoints, such as endocrine disruption, reproductive toxicity, cardiovascular toxicity, and I believe some efforts are underway in various places to do this, and it makes sense to me to ap apply this type of approach. So this just basically says what I just said, which is the language in the actual latest uh, risk evaluation, um, risk-related evaluation report from the National Academy. Uh, and the important point I want to make here is referred to, it avoids the, uh, down in the second part, the approach, the key characteristic approach, avoids the narrow focus on specific pathways and hypotheses and provides a broad holistic consideration of the mechanistic evidence. This is what we need, rather than somebody's favorite mechanism of how something works, and then applying regulations around this. It's going to be much harder to, do, uh, to basically decide on a mechanism as an expert working group, and then have other people say, well, it doesn't work that way. Whereas the key characteristics mechanism allows you to look at the whole ba database and the evidence and reach pretty easy conclusions for our, by, by a working group. So in summary then, the scientific findings provide insights that cancer mechanisms play an essential role in cancer hazard identification. And the key characteristics are a known basis for a, a systematic approach for identifying and evaluating the mechanistic data. I'll let you read the rest as I'm out of time. And I'll thank everybody. This was an actually a very large group. Kate Guyton from IARC has been very helpful and co-authored this with me. Uh, as of IARC, it's also involved EPA, NTP, various academia, <coughs> and my wife, uh, Michelle LaMerrill, who was, uh, I've been married to for six months, who uh, keeps me uh, honest and uh, has discussed this pro with me a lot. Thank you very much.